Hello, my name is Neil Ferguson. I'm the Milbank Family Senior Fellow here at the Hoover Institution and the chair of the Hoover History Working Group. And uh, today we've heard a terrific presentation uh, by uh, my guest, Margaret O'Meara, who is the Scott and Dorothy Bullock Professor of American History at the University of Washington and the author of The Code, Silicon Valley, and the remaking of America. Margaret, welcome to Hoover. Wow, um, you. you argue in the book that there's a kind of symbiotic relationship between the dynamic private sector that flourishes in California mm -hmm. after World War II and the US government over in Washington, DC, the other Washington. Yeah. Uh, talk a bit about that. And, and why did that symbiotic relationship produce Silicon Valley as opposed to, oh, I don't know, Chicago Valley or some yeah. other valley? Yeah. 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 Funnily enough, uh, Dwight Eisenhower never said, I shall build a silicon, a science city in right. Northern California. There was, was never a plan. There was never a plan, which, of course, is the glorious part of history when mm. it's all just messy and unplanned. But nonetheless, it is this combination of, of top down spending um, for geopolitical reasons. The beginning of the Cold War is a hinge of history for this for this place, which was mostly agricultural and distinguished by its University, Stanford in the middle, but uh, uh, it is uh, this flood of spending comes uh, into the military sector and for specifically for electronics and small communication devices, which happen to be the thing that this region does already have a subspecialty in radio communication, um, long distance wireless communication, uh, miniature electronics, companies like Hewlett Packard founded right before the war. And so this, this combination of, of core competencies, the sort of regional conditions here, and then this influx of resources changes it. And so the first you know, 20 years of the Valley, are, it is chiefly, almost entirely a defense economy. Um, and, and then it changes as the uh, Vietnam War drawdown and sp military spending. There's a bit of crescendo in the 80s with the, the, during the Reagan years and, and reinvestment in the military. And then, but then this is not just a military story. It's a story of investment in research and in higher education and also in, uh, and, and in creating conditions for entrepreneurship. So I think that's the other, the, the other part of it that's very important. Well, I'm glad you said higher education because we are sitting here at we the are. Hoover Institution yeah. at the heart of the Stanford campus. Yeah. And it's pretty hard to imagine Silicon Valley without Stanford. So yeah. what's the role that the university plays? Yeah. MIT was already in mm -hmm. a way the place that yeah that to epitomize the link from defense contracts to academia. Mm -hmm. And one might have expected it to have dominated uh, yeah. in the Cold War. But Stanford comes along. How come? And is it Stanford that just gets lucky? Or does Stanford have a game plan? <laughs> yeah, coming out of the Second World War, uh, not only were you know, MIT and Harvard were the leading research institutions, and the leaders of those institutions were the ones designing post-war federal research. I mean, they were the architects of it. And so Stanford was not the logical, not a logical player, but it had a very important connection in the person of Fred Terman, who was the Dean of Engineering and then Provost, who had trained as a graduate student at MIT under one of those architects, Vannevar Bush, right. uh, and, and understood that there was a real change coming and that very, he and other leaders of the university, the then president Wallace Sterling, a historian, and others, uh, decided to profoundly reorganize what Stanford did to build up what, what Terman famously called steeples of excellence in the sciences and engineering, uh, to make it more like MIT, quite frankly. It already had a scientific and technological bent from the very beginning, but it really doubled down on it. And to develop Stanford lands, the 9,000, nearly 9,000 acres, that the university received in its founding grant from the Stanfords, that the Stanford said, you may not sell it, you can develop it, but don't sell it. Um, quite the albatross for some decades right. for them. And then it's developed not only into the uh, faculty housing and the Stanford Shopping <laughs> Center, but also the Stanford Research Park and a very deliberate economic development strategy directed at electronics industries and high-tech industries. So the university plays this critical role. And it's not just, you know, oftentimes we think of universities as, um, you know, uh, invention spins off and, and then gets commercialized. And that's the, 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 the contribution. The real thing, and it's very clear in the case of Stanford, it's people. It's the people in the university. 
and it's the people who are educated here and then go off and start companies. And the entrepreneurial culture that is fostered here that allows this movement back and forth between industry and the university in, in a way that horrified many academics. Mm. <laughs> I, I think um, you know, our fellow humanists were not happy yeah. about it. Um, and it, it, but it, it was a strategy that only Stanford as a private university could do. And it proved extraordinarily generative. And, you know, and, and also I think this place being what it is, you know, agricultural valley with a few far, small towns, there isn't a you know, big city, a downtown, a center. Stanford has become the de facto town square. It is the center of the action in a way that's unlike any other university in the United States. Why do you think it's so hard to replicate this uh, you, you've given talks about this book mm -hmm. all over the world, and yeah. I should imagine that pretty much everywhere you go, somebody's got a, a silicon fen or a silicon mm -hmm. glen or a yeah. silicon piazza, and yet somehow none of these imitations ever quite uh, catch fire. Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, imitation is the easiest type of economic development, right? You say, oh, they build this, we're going to build one of those. And sometimes that works. And sometimes but in this that case, works. It does not. And, you know, it's so historically specific and contingent and the product of not just simply this wave of Cold War spending and the military industrial complex, but also the US space program, which of course is part of the Cold War. Let's yeah. be clear that yeah. you know the Americans want to land on the moon to get there before the Soviets do. Um, but that spending on small electronics and communication devices, all of the, the money that that puts into the system, the federal money that puts into the system for military uses. I mean, the, Look, war is the one, the one thing that the United States has been willing to spend copiously on. You know, there's a lot of, um, uh, it, it kind of, with a geopolitical justification, kind of gave this urgency and gave a lot of political leeway to spend a lot of money on things that didn't have an immediate application. And that was incredibly useful, in, not only in terms of being a customer to small startups in the silicon chip business, in the 1960s, but also in um, fostering basic research and science education in universities and research institutes. Yeah, give the example of Fairchild Semiconductor, mm -hmm. 1957. Yes. It's founded the year of Sputnik, where the challenge from the Soviet Union seems uh, a mortal threat yeah. to the United States. Yeah. The Soviets had the science. They certainly had mm -hmm. the scientists. They had universities. Mm -hmm. They had defense spending. But there's a complete failure to replicate uh, the semiconductor industry. And that means mm -hmm. that the Soviets lose the computer race. They've mm -hmm. been able to compete on atomic mm -hmm. weapons in space, but they can't compete when it comes uh, to silicon. And, and that, yeah. that's a remarkable thing in itself. I, I've been thinking a lot about this because it seems to be at the mm -hmm. heart of another very interesting book on, the, on a similar topic, Chris Miller's yeah, yeah. Chip War. And, yeah. and, and part of the story there is the Soviets just can't do this. There's nothing yeah. they can do. They know they can't do it. They can, yeah. they can, they can steal the chips, but they can't replicate yeah. them. Yeah. And yet something seems to kind of go wrong in the story, namely that outsourcing, offshoring happens, mm -hmm. and without anybody quite noticing in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. a really significant part of the semiconductor industry ends up outside the United States mm -hmm. and indeed ends up in the strategically rather vulnerable location of, of Taiwan. Yeah. Was this a case of nobody quite paying attention, or are there other reasons why Silicon Valley does get replicated in yeah. a way yeah. in, uh, in TSMC's yeah. fabs in Taiwan? Yeah. Well, it's you know the 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 offshoring of of, uh, of semiconductor manufacturing, like the offshoring of other manu other goods, is both a push and a pull, right? So the the, the chip makers here are some of the veryest er, very earliest to outsource. In 1963, Fairchild and Na National are going to East Asia, just incredibly early. They are looking for lower cost labor. They are looking for, you know, to, to maximize efficiency and speed, uh, to be able to produce things as quickly. And they're also going up against this the dual threat of um, the, uh, you know, the other, their, their other competitors and just being able to get a, you know, minimum viable product that can have a commercial market, not just a defense mm -hmm. one. And also the growth of these uh, East Asian uh, economies that are doing de capitalist developmentalism very aggressively starting in the 60s and 70s and 80s, right? So you have Singapore and Japan and who are kind of creating the conditions to encourage American firms to come over. And the eye is not on, you know, I, you know, my, the, the 
fo the focus is on the Soviets mm. as, a, as a competitor and a threat, um, certainly in the 1960s into the 1970s. And by the 80s, it's all about Japan. And so anything that is going to increase the competitive advantage of American firms in the global marketplace, even if that means the building, this has to become an outs outsourced and offshore industry. There was just no, yeah, I, I think you know, no one was really paying attention. And there also, I think the other thing that's, that's a, a factor here is, you know, coming into the 1970s, at the moment that the chip makers are kind of really becoming kind of enterprise you know, uh, the, the commodity chip business is happening. This Richard Nixon is, and his, in the Nixon White House are saying, how can we get, we have our, all of our technological, you know, world is so dominated by defense. And we need to get the private, we need to privatize it some more. We need to find commercial applications. We need to encourage the private sector to really, you know, be, be central to this, not have it all ruled by, you know, the, the government. And so that too is, you know, really going to prevent uh, the Nixon administration or, or successive administration for that matter to kind of come in and tell chip makers what to do, particularly when they're getting more and more challenged by m much more agile competitors overseas. Fast forward to 2022 and we have the Chips and Science Act, which mm -hmm feels a little bit like your story coming full circle. Once yeah. again, the federal government yes. is going to bring uh, out its checkbook and, and try to, to reignite yeah. uh, the hardware uh, side of, uh, of the US economy. Can it work or is this a, an attempt to resuscitate a patient that's already mm. DOA, dead on arrival? I'm impressed by the amount of money. Uh, it's gonna do something. It's a lot of money, and it's money that is being structured in a way that is designed to geographically deconcentrate the, the industry and bring it to bring high-tech manufacturing into new places, into economically depressed places. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean those places are going to be revived, but it is going to have an interesting, um, the way it's, you know, working in, in uh, with, with the existing growth of tech clusters in other parts of the country that are small but growing, and, and every look, every company is a technology-enabled company. Everyone needs really good software engineers on staff. So that's, that's you know, we, we, tech has become kind of a much larger field. Um, and, and it's also structured as a public-private partnership. So it's, it's going to kind of, in, it's incentivizing private markets and private companies, private capital to behave in certain ways, and also making big bets a little more feasible in the way that the Apollo program made the integrated circuit mm. a more feasible bet because you had someone who's gonna buy the things <laughs> and you had, you know, kind of, you weren't just blue skying it with no, no way to apply it. The same goes with these, you know, when you have money um, it kind of subsidizing something that uh, is going to allow you as a company to invest in R&D at, at a greater scale. You know, when, green energy, for example. Yeah. And, and qu quite honestly, I think because it is framed rightly as a geopolitical, um, addressing a, 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 a geopolitical problem as a, a threat to national security, that it gives it it gives it political support on a broader scale than if it were simply framed as a domestic economic program. It's almost as if the US needs a cold war to kind of get do. this kind of symbiosis between <laughs> government and private sector to work. Well, uh, uh, one of the consequences of, uh, of Stanford's involvement in all of this has been, I suppose, for history to recede mm. as a force on mm -hmm. this campus. Mm -hmm. But you are reminding all those people in uh, engineering and computer science that yes, they too have a history. The book once again is The Code, Silicon Valley and the Remaking of America. We've been enormously lucky to have Margaret O'Meara here with us to tell the story. Uh, thank you so much uh, for listening and Margaret, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure.